I want to thank Dr. Goshal and Helen and the rest of the team at Washington Quantum Computing Meetup for having me and organizing this and Cambridge Quantum Computing that sponsors uh, their group. I tried to make this an introductory talk and I see that there is a lot of variation in our audience. And um, so there is not, uh, I tried to make it inclusive and not too technical, but if you have questions, we can talk about them at the end. Uh, let's start. The outline goes like this, that um, because of the variation in the audience, I will do like a quick review of quantum mechanics, um, just, you know, a review of essentially the principles that we take forward to uh, machine learning and can do quantum machine learning with it. So what are these important or different principles? And uh, then we look at the different approaches and areas in quantum machine learning. And at the end, uh, we'll look at this uh, software penny lane which is this really amazing software exclusively made to do quantum machine learning. And uh, uh, yeah, we'll look at an example uh, of that. Okay, so quantum mechanics. So of course, the first thing that is very unique to quantum mechanics is superposition. So we know that when it comes to classical information theory, or um, uh, we have classical bits that can be their binary, they can be either zero or one. And uh, when we go towards quantum mechanics and want to represent information in quantum bits or qubits, um, this changes uh, from being binary to something that is a superposition. So the state could be a fraction in uh, the zero and the fraction of it could be in one. So it's sort of like a probability distribution. Okay. And then how do we represent the state in, in um, quantum mechanics? We represent it as a vector. Uh, which lives in this vector space or Hilbert space. And then we can nicely represent these alpha and beta components. And then you can uh, write it in terms of these very nice, um, uh, these basis vectors, uh, which in the rock notation, we just label them as zero and one. So basically, this is an orthonormal basis. You can write any vector that lives in this state in terms of this uh, zero and one. And uh, you can use any orthonormal basis, but this is quite nice because this is also the eigenbasis of the poly Z operator. So we'll see that later on. And uh, then, yeah, if you add more qubits, then you have to take the tensor product of your vector spaces. And then you have a larger vector basically that represents any state in, uh, in your Hilbert space. And um, so now your computational basis vector, so these bas basis vectors, they're termed computation basis vectors. Um, and so, yeah, these are then labeled, uh, usually we call them 0, 0, 0, 001 for ease. So any state that lives in this Hilbert space can be uh, described in terms of uh, these computational basis vectors. And as you add more and more qubits, then this vector grows exponentially large. So if you have like for two qubits, you have four dimensional uh, vector. If you have even just 10 qubits, you go up to a thousand uh, dimensional vector. So uh, this, of course, scales exponentially, which is something we keep in mind. OK, so another thing that's very unique to quantum mechanics is interference. And uh, we looked at this alpha and beta, and we know that this is sort of a probability distribution uh, on this 0 and 1 state. And, and as a result, it has to satisfy this, uh, this um, uh, condition. So, but the thing about the, the difference here is that alpha and beta can be complex. So the, this Hilbert space is a complex vector space and alpha beta are complex numbers. So what this leads to is this very unique phenomenon of interference where, uh, which, you know, if you have uh, classical probabilities and if you add them, you can only, you can, you know, you can, they can only add up. Uh, but in quantum mechanics, uh, you can have phases which are negative and, and so you can sort of cancel out probabilities, which sounds really strange, but this is what uh, leads to interference. So um, the next thing is now we have our quantum state, which we know is, uh, you know, it's a probability distribution, so it has to have a unit norm. And uh, then how do we manipulate the state? Because we want to preserve as unit norm, we can only do unitary evolutions or unitary operations on it. Okay. So another thing is measurement. So if you want to sort of know what your state is made up of, or if you want to measure or observe something in your, you know, in your, in your physical background, if I want to measure the the objects, uh, uh, any objects position or momentum, so observable that you want to see, then you have to uh, sort of express it in terms of um, Hermitian observable. Here it's labeled uh, called A, 
And why we need it to be Hermitian is because it has Hermitian observables have uh, real eigenvalues and that we can relate to something we can see. But essentially when you measure is uh, basically you're sampling from this probability distribution that is your wave function. And uh, if you do it many, many times, then you can uh, sort of get the expectation value of your um, observable. So all of these are just uh, to know. So we need to know how what quantum states are. So we know these are huge vectors. Um, we know how to uh, sort of manipulate them and that we do by unitary evolution. And we have the measurement to, uh, to, to uh, sort of measure something physical. And um, so these things, after you know this, we'll see them later on in our quantum machine learning circuits. But another thing that we cannot uh, leave out is entanglement, which is also a very unique feature, and th there's no classical counterpart part to it. So entanglement is uh, is when you have you cannot describe the properties of two. Uh, so entanglement can be in many uh, it can be between many uh, bodies as well. But let's just talk about two of them. And then you cannot describe the properties of the combined two uh, states in terms of the individual uh, particles properties. And this is something really strange, um, but uh, and we cannot really explain why this happens or where this comes from, but uh, we know that it, ex uh, it exists and it has been proven many, many, many times. So for example, I can give you a very quick, simple example. Um, here again, we, the, now you know what these computational basis states are. If you still have questions, we can take them at the end. So this is uh, basically a superposition. Uh, so the part, there are two particles and half the time they're in this state and uh, other half they're in this state. And this is an uh, example of a Bell state, it's one of the Bell states. And now let's just very simply try to express the state in terms of two qubits. So you have alpha one zero, beta one one. This is one qubit and this is the other one. And no matter how hard you try, you would never be able to achieve any alpha beta that, are, that would express these two qubits as a Bell state. So you can just try and it would, you know, it, there's, you see a conflict in, in, uh, in the parameters. So yeah, it's very strange, but it's really uh, important because this is something that is, again, unique and, um, something that we hope uh, gives uh, quantum machine learning, it's, you know, it's different. So it might be able to see correlations in, in data that a classical machine learning algorithm might not be able to do. So uh, this, uh, just as a side note, if you're interested, uh, this also really bothered, this entanglement phenomena really bothered Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. They have this really nice paper. If you want to have a look at it, it's uh, just for fun as well, it's really, nicely written. Um, so I'll highly recommend that. Okay, so what kind of quantum systems are being used and how do we encode information? How do we make qubits? Uh, so maybe I give a little bit of background. Um, so I think from the 80s up to 2000, uh, there was the, all the research about quantum computing and quantum information was mostly theoretical and um, because we didn't have any uh, the techno technological advancement or the technology to, you know, sort of look for these quantum systems at the time. And most of the algorithms from those times are theoretical. They're just based in the mathematics um, of quantum mechanics. And, you know, if you, and they say, if you have perfect quantum computer, if you have a perfect system, then you can do this and this, like Shor algorithm or Grover's algorithm, right? And um, then I think on 2000 on onwards, it, there a, a huge effort globally started in um, many, many experimental groups started to look into what kind of quantum systems could be uh, treated. And we, the idea is that we can manipulate them. We can identify states, which we could label as zero and one, that we can manipulate these states, like we can excite them and have them interact, uh, that we're able to uh, also, you know, make measurements and, um, and scale up. Scaling is also a very important criteria. So yeah, many different systems are, have been like tested uh, so, far, uh, so far. And so for example, one of them is uh, color centers in diamond. So um, this is a very interesting system. You basically have defects in diamond that have molecular uh, states that you can uh, try to manipulate. You could have topological qubits. Uh, you could have superconducting qubits like wood, um, IBM, and um, 
what IBM and Google have. And so here, basically, you encode information in the spin or the direction of the, uh, the current circulation. You could have atoms or trapped ions. And then, for example, in the atom, you could have its different atomic levels. And uh, you can see them as 0 and 1 state. And, um, and then try to manipulate that with lasers or electric field and so on and so forth. So for the, uh, uh, the first one, for example, is this, uh, it's a photonic chip that we uh, make or use at Xanadu. And we use photons and photons in basically they are you know harmonic oscillators so we essentially have infinite dimensional um, vectors so a lot of different systems they all have their pros and cons um, but maybe i mentioned that in the last three four years um, we started to see what we call now near-term devices so i think ibm uh, uh, takes um, you know the lead in this for now that um, you can just access i don't know if you guys know about this but you can access IBM's like four qubit small device, um, I think up to 16 qubit device, and you can just access over cloud and you'll be uh, sort of, um, you know, playing around with the qubits that they have, they're sitting in the, in the dilution fridges in, in, in their centers. So with these uh, devices coming available, um, we are really talking about what we could do with it. And, um, it turns out that because we we know that uh, this this um, this vector space of of qubits, as you add more and more qubits, this Hilbert space ex really exponentially becomes bigger and bigger. So even if you have ten qubits, you can essentially encode you know in principle thousand data points uh, of your of your classical data. If you have uh, just twenty qubits, you could do a billion data points. So it, it that there is like, there's something that we can bring. Uh, in even with this very small devices and that's where a lot of interest in quantum machine learning started and uh, a, a, there is a mixture of a lot of theoretical work and a lot of experimental work done on these IBM machines uh, are coming out and a lot more companies are now started to uh, offer uh, that uh, they will be also providing hardware over you know cloud access so yeah I think very exciting times are coming so I'll do a very uh, quick overview of machine learning very quick. I'm hoping that most of the people are familiar with it, uh, but I will still get like the gist of what it's about because it's a very big field and I cannot really <laughs> squeeze everything into this talk about quantum machine learning. So uh, we know that machine learning is basically about a gen a learning a model. So you have a model, which is a mathematical function and you have data and you want you parameterize this function and you try to generalize this or find the 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 parameters that basically or optimize the parameters that basically lead to some generalized um, uh, model that you could use for for example you could use it to pr make predictions to generate more data or to recognize patterns there's a lot of different uh, areas where machine learning is um, applicable and um, so it depends on what problem you, you have. So for example, if you, if you want to predict the stock market in the next month and you have the data of the last 20 years and you could apply some, you know, this uh, prediction model to it. Or if, for example, you have, you know, like in, we can have this very current example of uh, if you have images of the lungs of a patient who might or might not have the COVID, uh, then you can also like, uh, teach uh, or optimize a model that learns to differentiate them that comes in classification. So depending on what kind of problem you have, you, you, know, uh, you need the data and then you try to pick the model that suits uh, this problem, make a cost function and try to optimize it. But with some initial parameters, for example, at A, and then you try to use some optimization method. It could be gradient based, it could be gradient free, any, anything that you want. And the idea is to find the optimal parameters. But to keep in mind that we, it's not just fitting data, uh, but we want to make generalized models that can do much more. They can you know, uh, go further out of the training data and can predict or you know, classify whatever problem you have on unseen data as well. And yeah, like I said, the cost function is not always this nice convex shape. And you could have really complex uh, cost functions uh, where uh, you have these uh, a lot of valleys and peaks and you might need a nudger in there. And there are a huge variety of optimizers that uh, are now 
currently available in many machine learning softwares like PyTorch and, and TensorFlow that you could use. So just to, as a side note. Okay, um, before I go to uh, quantum machine learning, I think I cannot just skip neural networks also because uh, they have a lot in common with the quantum circuits that we'll see later on. And uh, so I, I, I won't go into a lot of detail, but uh, uh, basically, each of this node, it's, um, it, it's really, so this whole neural network is modeled against uh, how, how our brain has different neurons and they're communicating to each other. And some of them might have a more like a strong connection and others not. And, um, and the neural network like talks to all of its connected neighbors and then it's, you know, it gets the input from all of them. And then that there's a certain threshold after which it fires. And this is the there's there's a similar concept here, and uh, so you basically have this weights and different inputs, and it you know you also have you can use different activation functions like a sigmoid is uh, depicted here, and then you have uh, you know some output that comes out and goes to the next next layer. But basically, you're doing some kind of uh, matrix multiplication in very simple terms. But this can also be huge uh, in in uh, dimension. Okay, and machine learning is the area where we try to bring all these very unique concepts from quantum mechanics. And, um, and we try to uh, see if we can either boost the current machine learning uh, algorithms, or if we can come up with our own novel algorithms that are just based on like the principles of quantum mechanics, uh, because it's possible uh, because of these unique uh, features that we are able to see, you know, like we are able to either generate very different kinds of patterns or recognize different correlations or just uh, be able to do uh, this whole linear algebra in a more efficient way. So these are all different um, things that everybody uh, who's doing quantum machine learning wants to check. Okay, um, so there are different approaches in machine learning. Uh, it's, uh, I wish it was simple, but um, it, there are different approaches that you can go into. So. Here in this side, we have what kind of a data you have. If you have classical data or quantum data. And on this side, uh, what kind of a device are you using? If Are you using classical uh, machine learning algorithms or are you using quantum device or quantum algorithm? And so for example, in the first uh, quadrant here, this is like classical machine learning, right? And then here uh, you could have quantum data and then you try to see or help it some way using classical machine learning. We'll see some examples of this, all of these. So don't worry if it's, um, you know, right now it's a lot. Um, then you can have classical data and you can see, okay, what could I do with quantum mechanics to, you know, come up with algorithms that do something, uh, you know, a novel or it could be similar, uh, but maybe faster, depends, uh, to this classical data. So this is mainly the field which is quite booming right now, uh, but also there are really interesting applications in these two quadrants here. Okay, very simple examples of where classical machine learning is helping physics, which is really interesting and a lot, of, uh, a lot more people are getting on board with this. So this is, um, for example, uh, some, uh, maybe I few, explain a few of them. So it could be, for example, uh, used to predict or uh, sort of uh, see the patterns in, to judge um, uh, phase transitions in matter, or for example, Designing physics experiments is a really interesting application because you know basically when you have you you're doing an experiment and you're trying to, it's it's basically a model with a lot of parameters, right? You have the laser, uh, maybe energy or the wavelength, or you have I don't know the mirror's angle, and all of these parameters you you spend hours to tune it and just get it right, and uh, machine learning here can really help because you know what is it? It's really a parameterized model that you're optimizing. So if it can tell you optimal parameters for your experiment, you might be, you know, it saves you a lot of time and you might be able to even design um, some very interesting experiments. Okay. Um, and another very important application could be error correction. So uh, it, error correction in quantum computers is not as easy and straightforward as it's in classical computers. So, you know, like in your, uh, your quantum, our, this just this laptop, it's now really good at, you know, error correcting itself because they just make a lot of redundant copies and then they just see oh, what, 
where um, you know the bit was lost or where the information was lost. But it's really hard to do the same thing because quantum states are not the same. They are, you know, you, you have um, you have this no cloning theorem. So I won't go into detail, but it's not easy to do error correction. And um, there was this really nice paper that, uh, and a lot more work is coming out in this direction where you can try and use machine learning to sort of um, discern the patterns of this, this where the errors could be coming from. And this would be, this is really, uh, you know, could have a lot of impact because going forward, um, we cannot have a quantum computer without error correction. So these small devices, they're noisy, but if you have to, you know, to build, uh, if you have to scale up and if you want to make a full tolerant quantum computer, error correction is really important. So this is a really nice application too. Okay. Uh, so the category that's, which is probably more relevant to the audience as well, because I saw that there were some engineers, maybe some from somebody from the banking sector. Um, but th so this is more relevant in the sense because you have classical data and you try to see how you can enhance the machine learning uh, using quantum mechanics. So that's why it's, this is the algorithms here are usually termed quantum enhanced uh, algorithms. And there are two types of algorithms that you can sort of um, see in this area right now. There are coherent algorithms. And here, what you basically do is you, um, this relies on having a proper quantum computer. This is not a noisy, small scale devices that we have right now. This requires a proper one. And uh, here you basically are saying that, okay, all of these machine learning models are really doing a lot of matrix multiplication and they need to represent things as vectors. And we that's exactly what quantum mechanics does as well. It's all linear algebra with some unique features. And um, we can just replace that and do it with qubits. And they will take, of course, uh, you need lesser qubits, but also we'll see uh, speed ups because of all these quantum properties. So uh, this is sort of like changing part of the algorithm, just you know, adding something to its engine, uh, which is quantum. OK. And uh, another, the, uh, the, the other type of uh, algorithms, the hybrid ones that are being tested, and a lot of work is being done in it, this is very popular right now, is uh, it's the hybrid algorithms and uh, the variational quantum algorithms, which are you know, like an example of it, is uh, really popular right now. So we look at what variational quantum circuits are and what variational quantum algorithms mean. So before that, may, maybe you already were asking the question in your head that if we have classical data, how do we incorporate it with quantum mechanics? And um, the answer is that you have to first convert classical data into a quantum state, and that you call quantum embedding. And, uh, the, and there could be different types uh, of embedding you could have a uh, fixed embedding. So this is like a fixed protocol or like a, you can say a fix, fixed box in which you put your classical data and a quantum state comes out. So they, they, there are different ways of defining this protocol. So it could be angle-based, this basis embedding, amplitude embedding. So I'll, I will look at an example. So don't worry about that. Um, and then, uh, but this embedding doesn't have to be fixed. It can also be trainable that, uh, you know, use, uh, we'll look at it later as well, uh, what that means, but it doesn't have to be a fixed protocol. You could essentially learn how to, how to you know, what state really fits uh, the problem or the model that you have. And um, this is a very recent sort of uh, uh, insight. And uh, this, um, we came up with this really nice paper, if anybody's interested to look at it in, uh, in more detail. OK, so let's look at an example of one of these embeddings and what it means. So amplitude embedding is where you have, you, you're given your x's. Let's call that x1, x2, x3. You have some classical data. And uh, then how do you convert it to quantum state is that each of this x here is the classical data. And it becomes the amplitude of your a uh, computational basis state, the ith computational basis state. We'll, we can look at an example. Now what you do is you firstly normalize it, and then each of this becomes the amplitude of the corresponding computational basis state. So these we saw earlier on. So these sort of become the alpha, beta. And um, 
and you can see that there is no zero one state and then uh, similarly the one zero and one one so this is a very you know firstly it's fixed it, no matter how your data looks you need to you know, uh, uh, you, you go to the same protocol, you have to add more qubits if required. So for example, if I had five, um, if I had five features of five X values, I would have to use three qubits. If you have three qubits, then of course you have a dimensional uh, quantum state, and then you have like uh, these, you know, um, state, these amplitudes that are not being used. Uh, so yeah, and not, not the best, but you cannot, it, you can only increase in you know one qubit, two qubit, three qubits, so it, it goes from two, four, and eight, and so on and so forth. So, I hope this is. If you have questions, we can talk about this at the end. I hope it's not too uh, complicated. Okay, so now we know how to bring the the classical data into a quantum state, and that we could term state preparation because if you use any kind of uh, software, we usually have this convention now that uh, all the wires are started in this uh, zero state, which is this one zero vector. And uh, and then you could have you know, a unit tree that prepares your state. It could be a fix, it could depend on theta or x. So you know this is open. Um, then you manipulate it. Uh, you sort of uh, apply some kind of unit tree and you try to change the state so that you, you're able to do something useful, essentially. And uh, then in the end comes measurement. And all of these, you can see, could be variable and could depend on the data. It, so this is like a lot of, uh, you can do a lot of different uh, manipulations here. And then in the end, you measure some observable and it throws out a number, right? You uh, Observable, you measure real value and that's a number that you can take and use. And uh, why do we do that? We'll come to that. Okay, uh, so maybe before uh, we go into more detail, we can look at a, an example. So, so there is really no rule here. You could essentially make any kind of circuit architecture you want. Um, and um, a lot of work has been done with fixed embeddings and then training the middle part with some cost function at the end. And you can sort of like train the unit tree or learn the unit tree, the right parameters that attain a certain state that you want. Um, but yeah, you, this architecture is an open question as well in research um, that what kind of architecture serves, what kind of problem, what, what are the limits, how expressive they are, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, this is, uh, uh, if anybody's interested in doing research in this, uh, this is an open question. So I said that uh, we were, when we measure, we get a real number, some classical scalar number out, right? And uh, why do we do that? So that is used in training these uh, variational corner circuits. So, because these are variational, right? We want to change the parameters and how do we do that? So what is currently done, one way of doing it is that the quantum part is really expensive, especially if you're doing it on some actual hardware. So this part is expensive, but doing optimization with the number is very cheap, right? You can do it very, very, very quickly on your on your classical computer. So what we do is we sort of export this optimization part to the to, to the classical computer, and uh, so uh, let's say we we start with some initial parameters. We have some cost function. We run our circuit, however we defined it, and um, we get the output. We measure some observable we want. And then we put that number in the cost function and we check, okay, was our cost, you know, decreasing? Did it get optimized? And class, you can just, you know, um, uh, use any optimization method here to uh, sort of move the parameters in the direction. It could be gradient based, non gradient based, as you wish, um, to uh, sort of nudge the parameters and change them so that the optimization would be better. And then you put these parameters again, you redo your circuit, and then it goes on, you know cycle until you have uh, the desired cost uh, at the end. Um, so in the end, what do we want to be able to do? We want to uh, be able to have this quantum node, this uh, basically a box which contains all this quantum circuit. And we want that we can define a hybrid computational, this computational graph where the, the quantum circuit can talk to a classical 
node and they you know they can all talk to each other you know it can uplift some part of uh, you know where it does better some part of the model the classical node the, does the other part so it, there is no really you know limit to what we can do here and currently the research is really going towards finding um a, a sort of combinations of these two, uh, either classical or quantum or both uh, where we can really find uh, sort of novel algorithms or come up with unique unitaries that are not just, you know, just quantum and so it, it you know, does something, but actually it's useful then we can, you know, solve some real complicated problems. Um, so also having, uh, you know, the idea is that uh, maybe in the future as well, even when we have uh, quantum computers, um, it could be that we still use them as sort of like a part of the whole classical computer we might not like replace the whole classical computer because really optimized well done um uh, machine and we might just have you know accelerators for example right now you have uh, graphic accelerators right like the, the gpus uh you could have something like a Q qpu a quantum, quantum processing unit and that could accelerate certain parts of computation so but if you want to talk about a computational graph then you start thinking that okay that means that everything has to be differentiable, right? So if you have worked with TensorFlow, for example, uh, you define this graph and it has to be able to back propagate and everything has to be differentiable because we want to optimize. And that means that we need to be able to compute the gradient with respect to any parameter we want to change. Um, so I won't go into the technical detail of this, but I'll just comment here that this is actually doable, uh, that you can take the gradient of a quantum circuit. This is a um, uh, really uh, nice idea, and if you want, we can discuss it at the end. Um, but yeah, this is doable and it's implemented in this software that we talked about. Uh, so yeah, uh, maybe just a few examples again of some, uh, this is really a very small subset of uh, the different uh, algorithms and ideas that are coming out of uh, quantum machine learning. Again, this is classical data and somehow you enhance machine learning or you have uh, a quantum algorithm itself that uh, you know talks to this classical data and does some uh, uh, machine learning so uh, for example the vqe is a very important example if somebody is working in the pharma industry this is very important for for quantum chemistry because what uh, it's called variational quantum eigenstoller so basically in general, it's really hard to find, you know, if you have a molecule and you need to find its ground state or the ground state wave function, it's really hard to do it. Uh, you know, there are all these DFT theories and all these complicated computational models that have been used so far. And this is, uh, you know, you take a variational quantum circuit and you start with some sort of wave function as an ansatz, and then you, your unit three is your Hamiltonian and you measure it and you're measuring the energy, right? And so you want to minimize the energy and you do that by changing the, the parameters of the circuit, which is your, your wave function. And then essentially what you're doing is you're reducing energy until you reach your uh, ground state wave function. So very, you know, extremely uh, clever, but very important. And uh, uh, it sounds like, you know, when you look at variation quantum circuits, it sounds really, oh, it's, you know, oh, you just change parameters in a unitary, but it can actually have a lot of power. And this is exactly, uh, where we want to go. It's not just the idea of just putting quantum uh, mechanics in this because, you know, why not? It's there. Uh, but the idea is to really come up with uh, some kind of, you know, algorithms that look at um, correlations or patterns that classical data could, or classical algorithms could never do. So we have, you have to be careful about, you know, there's a lot of hype about this right now, uh, about quantum computing, and there's a revolution here. Uh, everything is changing, but you have to be, you know, now that you know the science behind it, you have to be more careful in, you know, what you read because, or, or what you accept, because um, having an exponential speed up is not always, you know, it's not trivial to say if we'll have an exponential speed up. It could be sometimes more expensive. It could be, um, you know, that it does quadratically better. But it's not about just having speed up. Like, it's about really looking for something different. So uh, this is something that I would, you know, caution the audience with because a lot of people just, you know, get swept away in the terms and the, the fancy terms of machine learning or it's quantum computing. So, uh, yeah, okay, uh, we're almost there. 
let me just quickly look at this really amazing software penny lane that is um uh we can just do a live tutorial okay i already have the jupyter notebook open for you and this is a very i i think i hope the zoom is enough so this is um a very basic example like you know a very simple example of essentially how penilin works so but there are many more uh, more complicated and uh, different levels of examples you can find on the penilin website we can have a look later um so what we want to do is we take one qubit and it's in state zero this one zero vector and we will just want to apply some unitary that rotates it to state one so i have a figure here so essentially uh, i hope you're familiar with this block sphere but basically uh, this is the zero state and all of the states here are possible any quantum states for one uh one qubit or two-dimensional uh hilbert space and um so yeah basically what we want to do is rotate this qubit from zero to one so now you can see that you know we can do it around y but just like doing a pi around the y-axis or you could do a pi rotation around the x-axis right so this is what we want to do so how how does penny lane do that we firstly you have to install penny lane you can import it we're calling it qml just for ease so uh, we don't have to type the whole thing again and uh, all this whole software is built up in in python so it has its own version of numpy and you can import that simply from you can say penny lane import uh, the numpy version of the penny lane and then we need to tell it what kind of a device what kind of a device is hosting this qubit uh, and there you have a lot of options so uh, here what you see is default qubit which is penny lane's own built-in qubit simulator so it's a simulator it's not hardware but penny lane is very unique it actually uh, gives you access to I think almost all existing hardwares and other simulators that all different companies are offering. So you just basically only have to change this uh, one string here and you can access you know, the IBM's machine or uh, uh, Google's machine. So I can show you here, like these are called plugins and you could do, and you could, for example, connect to IBM's Qiskit, Google Cirque, uh, Rigetti is another hardware provider uh, Microsoft and uh, Strobe Fields is um, the photonic continuous variable um, software. So you can do anything here. It's, it's really friendly and it's, um, I think it's really amazing and unique in how it connects to all of these different um, hardware options. Um, so here, uh, then wires is basically the number, you know, we saw the circuit with the wires and this is the number of qubits essentially that you want to initialize and you just do QML the device and you add your um, simulate or hardware, whatever you're using and the number of qubits you want. And it's always initialized in this state, in state zero. So we are already in state zero and we just need to rotate it, right? So now we define this Q node. So this is the quantum node where uh, the quantum circuit lives and we define all the functions here. So we already know uh, what we need to do. We just need to do a rotation, right? But let's just, let's pretend we don't know what rotation to do. And we say, okay, let's do two rotations on this wire zero, which is, uh, it's uh, the wires go from zero, one, two, three. So they start from zero, the numbering. Um, and we just say, okay, on this wire, apply a rotation about the X axis and we give these parameters so uh, it's array of parameters and um, we do a rotation about the y-axis as well and you'll see later on that you know this is uh, that one of the par parameters will be pi and the other would be zero because you know this is kind of redundant but we want to the circuit to learn this on its own okay so now what do we measure um so this uh, this is again we can define this really cleverly right we want some observable that really easily measures if you're in state zero or in state one right and um, most of you probably already are familiar with poly operators um but if for for completion uh basically this is basically just this unitary matrix one zero zero minus one you when you apply it to the state um, like I said in the beginning, the computational basis vectors are they're the eigenbasis of this poly operator. So you have uh, one zero, and you add, it basically gives one eigenvalue, 
And if you're in state one, it gives you minus one eigenvalue, right? So we have some very a clear indicator of whether we use state zero and one. So we'll just observe this. Very simple, but very clever still. And um, uh, so, so we just uh, tell the computer or the corner circuit to measure poly Z on wire zero. So in the parentheses, you mentioned the wire number. And again, uh, like I said, you want to do measurements and you want to do it many, many times. And this, you want to get the uh, expectation value, right? And already, Penny Lane does all of that for you. Uh, so you don't need to like do this many times. You just call exp val, which is expectation value. And it calculates, so it repeats the circuit uh, in the back end many, many times and gives you the expectation value uh, of this operator. So you can now just simply uh, very nicely call this function uh, like any other Python function. So we called it circuit. So you just call circuit with some parameters. Like here, the parameters are sort of very small. So we're still very close to the zero state. We haven't moved it very much. So you can see that the eigenvalue uh, that the circuit gives you is still quite close to one. And we want to go to eigenvalue minus one, in which the state would be one, right? So then this becomes really easy. It's a very simple example, but um, I think it still very, uh, you know, highlights all the very nice features of Penny Lane. Uh, so we already know what our cost function then should be, right? Because we want to reduce the cost. So you can just simply uh, um, define the cost function as your circuit output. So when it's one, you know, you want to reduce the cost function, it wants to go towards minus one. And, um, so we can start some with some initial parameters. Then again, we, we can you know give some very small ones as you wish. It doesn't really matter. Well, sometimes it matters, <laughs> but uh, if you yeah, if you don't have a convex cost function, that it matters a lot. Uh, <laughs> okay, and then what is left is to optimize uh, your circuit. And this is their built-in optimizers in in Penny Lane. So this is a gradient-based optimization, um, and you just do QML. Here, uh, you call the gradient descent optimizer, give it step size. It's very similar to what you have in TensorFlow or in PyTorch as well. You call, uh, you, know, you call your optimizer and you give it the cost function and the parameters. And um, so it's very similar to that, except here you would be using this cost function and the classical number, you know, the expectation value would be uh, used as this, uh, this the, the output of your quantum circuit. So now we have the optimizer, we define the number of steps. Uh, we have some in the, we say, okay, the parameters in the beginning are the initial parameters, and then we just run it. Um, and in every step, the optimizer op.step function, in every step, it you know checks the cost function, updates the parameters depending on the gradient. And uh, so this is like, you can, I, I, I already ran it, so we don't have to like waste time or spend time here. So actually, all this really quick, one qubits are extremely quick. Um, so you can see that already in, uh, it goes from one, already in step 25, it's very nicely close to minus one. And like, uh, you know, we can check what were the optimal parameters in the end, and they come out to be zero and pi, just as we expected. So, uh, yeah, I hope this was not too overwhelming for you. And uh, I would, uh, this is like a very, you know, basic example to start uh, Penny Lane from. But there are a, a lot of really nice demonstrations here that you can find on their website. And they take you like, you know, you can also get the, their, their uh, Jupyter notebooks or their Python files. And uh, you can do many different kinds. For example, you can do chemistry there. And they also, uh, put up tutorials on very recent research that uh, you know you if a new paper comes out you can just go and check this website here uh, and hopefully you can find something that it's explained much better uh, at, at times and also already implemented in Penny Lane so you can just you know download the file and play around with it and just you know better understand um, uh, not just you know the new research but also what's going on uh, in the field other features that I you don't didn't get to see in the demonstration, but you know you have uh, basically we talked about how you can interface with many different uh, simulators and hardware options, but also there's a range of optimizers. You can also um, interface with uh, classical machine learning languages, so with PyTorch and TensorFlow. So you know this whole uh, hybrid 
computation graph that I talked about. You can easily do this with a few lines of code. So uh, very, uh, I would highly recommend um, that you go to this website and have a look, especially their QML uh, section is, you know, um, they give a very good introduction to this whole field and explain different concepts uh, in this field as well. Um, so yeah, to summarize there, you know, I hope you um, were able to appreciate that, you know, uh, we could use or uplift these um, uh, features and principles from quantum mechanics to do something new and uh, amazing when, in machine learning. And, uh, but yes, there, there's still a lot of unsolved problems that uh, I hope that some of us and you are able to uh, go into. So yeah, uh, thank you. And I would now go back and end the presentation and we can take questions.